so now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Margaret Davidson, uh, who is the acting director of NOAA Office of Coastal Resource Management. Uh, she has been an active participant in coastal resource management issues since 1978, when she earned her Juris Doctorate in Natural Resources Law from Louisiana State University. Uh, Margaret, would you yes, like sir. to come up? Mm -hmm. So first you have an economist and now you have a lawyer on the other hand. Uh, also, uh, I've got a job titled change, so uh, I'm no longer responsible for people or monies. Uh, so anybody who thought they were going to suck up to me afterwards, don't bother. Uh, but the great news about it is uh, I am now totally unfettered. So let me say two things. Uh, one, uh, I live at five and a half feet in Charleston, South Carolina, and I grew up on the Redneck Riviera. So. Uh, I know something about this topic. It's not just a personal, it's not just a professional issue, it's a personal interest. I could show you pictures of blue herons from my bathroom window. Um, and as you can see, I might be a little nutty about things like coastal inundation, storm surge, sea level rise, all those kinds of things. Uh, and I would like to say that anything that I say is not the official opinion of my agency. So let me clarify that before I get rolling here. So you've had a really great uh, two and a half days where all that stands between you and the Sam Adams. Uh, I'm going to roll through a bunch of things pretty quickly here. Uh, satellite image, composite image, world at night, just shows you that there are a lot of people on the coast. Maybe uh, in the US, there's 60 million people we need to be worried about right now, and maybe something like 600 million people uh, worldwide, uh, just for a ballpark number. I'm a lawyer, I'm not an economist, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to be precise. Uh, I'm also one of the few people who actually skate between the disaster community and the climate community. They each keep pushing me back to the other one. Uh, but, but it's a growth industry. For you people who are under 30, uh, both of you, this is a growth industry. <laughs> the greater frequency and the greater severity of extreme events uh, is here and now. And in fact, in, in the part of the world in which I reside, uh, you don't talk about climate change so much. Uh, it's like golf, you've got to play it where it lies. So if they don't want to talk about climate change, if they think of climate like religion or two fairies, then all you have to do is talk about recent trend lines and extreme events. You know, stuff's going to happen. The likelihood of stuff going to happen to you is increasing, and the likelihood that it's going to cost a bunch of money is increasing. And more importantly, uh, we are the only crazy ass nation on the planet who bails out people after an extreme event for being dumbasses for living there in the first place. <laughs> okay. That's number one. Number two, you, you, before, years ago, like five, eight years ago, when we had disasters and we had these things called emergency supplementals, you might have heard of it up here, something to do with some storm called Sandy, uh, it used to be like monopoly money. It was like free money, and that was the, really the pigs at the trough. But now under the Budget Reconciliation Act, when we have to bail out people after Sandy, then that's coming out of the money that's available for science, available for health, available for education, let alone building a 30-foot wall in Arizona. So uh, there are real and imminent trade-offs right now, not in 20 years and certainly not in 80 years. So I like to talk about resilience. Uh, everything that we do to respond to and recover from a disaster event right now is either going to lock in our risk exposure, we may be able to hold it at that, or, or it's going to exacerbate it. And I'll talk about that some more. I also talk about what makes a community resilient. It is many different things. It's like a tapestry. So, some of those threads are infrastructure. Some of those threads are civic institutions, social institutions, kinship groups, neighborhood groups, uh, food banks, a whole range of cultural, social, and civic organizations, religious organizations. What we have found out, particularly in the last decade, from Katrina to Sandy to a bunch of other places, more Oklahoma, is those communities that have their tapestry somewhat intact. I mean, they could have a degraded ecosystem, they could have degraded social systems, they could have crappy civic systems, but if they have several of their threads intact, 
if they have good community kinship systems, for instance, or if they have great hardened and resilient infrastructure, if they have a few of these things intact, they're going to be more likely to respond to and recover from an extreme event quicker and better than a community that has all of its threads unraveling. So, so we can endure many insults. We just can't endure uh, a lot of them and expect us or any organism uh, to be resistant, um, to be resilient. Excuse me. In the biological community, there's something called an LD50. It means you can stress and stress and stress an organization, uh, an organi organism. And then at some point, whoops, that's too much, so much about that organism. The same way with our communities. We can all take a lot of stress. And, and if we're sort of resilient to begin with, then uh, when Mother Nature kicks our butt, uh, we're going to respond a little more quickly. So, uh, oh, this is commercial. We'll skip the government commercial. Uh, of course, as you know, in Fedlandia, we're actually beginning to do a few things uh, momentarily. Uh, in the next two and a half years, I think we'll do a lot on climate adaptation, which I'm delighted about. Uh, what happens come the uh, spring of 2016, I think, is anybody's uh, guess, certainly except maybe for Nate Silver. Uh, but remember, everything that we need to do for drought, wildfire, and coastal inundation, be it on a short time scale for an extreme event, or be it on a slightly longer, longer climate scale, is exactly the same. It's exactly the same what we need to do to our infrastructure and to our community institutions. So that FEMA money can actually make you more resilient about climate change if you're really smart. You know, no matter who the next president is, I know we're going to have to spend a lot of money on infrastructure or else we really will be that third world nation uh, that we're rapidly becoming. And here's the thing about it. That infrastructure is our great opportunity. Now, you already know that here in Boston, your uh, Metropolitan Water Authority has uh, been digging holes and other things for quite some time uh, and raising sewage and stormwater outfalls for a while. Congratulations, you're in the progressive enlightened part of the country. Uh, but in the rest of the country, they're also doing this. Uh, I would like to say that why feds are doing much uh, and some states are doing a bit more than feds are doing, where it's really happening is at the local level. So I'll talk about that too. I'm not going to mention the climate assessment. Just go and look at it online. But what I would like to tell you about the IPCC and the National Climate Assessment, by the time it's gotten published and you're reading a press release about it, a lot of the data in there, a lot of those papers that are in there are themselves based on data that is five to 10, if not years, older. So when you see things like a sea level rise scenario paper, which we produced in this country for the first time, well, uh, it's like an Aggie joke. What happens when you get 13 PhDs and three engineers in a room to talk about sea level rise? You get a range. Now, uh, if you're an engineer, that's not terribly useful. If you're a city planner, that's not very useful. So let me tell you what it doesn't say in IPCC or NCA. And Jim alluded to some of the shortcomings, like that pesky little Greenland and West Antarctica problem. Uh, but if you're under 50, I would embrace two meters by 2050. Just pick two meters as your number and get it on. Uh, whatever you're building, that's your number. It might be a little less. It might be a little more. But that's close enough for government work, I can assure you. Uh, and in the Army Corps of Engineers, finally after nearly a decade, uh, they're going to be using a scenario that's uh, a little closer to a meter and a half, uh, but they are fairly conservative engineers. So everyone in this room probably knows something about risk. Some of you may even have money in a 401k. Some of you may even think you're an amateur day trader and you've gone to Schwab or E-Trade and you've filled out those little surveys about how risk averse are you because it's supposed to tell you about your investment strategy. So what risk is, is not just a function of your geomorphology. Here you are sitting in a low writing area right here. But it's also about your tolerance for risk. There are some people in South Florida who have no self-awareness of where they're actually living and their tolerance for sea level rise is very high. And then if you're in some place like the state capitol, where they have a governor who uh, doesn't even believe in climate change, uh, of course, his tolerance for their risk is very high. 
Uh, but the five <laughs> southernmost counties in Florida have formed their own Southeast Florida Climate Compact. And they're making stuff happen. In fact, even in Miles, swamps of South Louisiana, where we have a Tea Party governor, uh, we actually raised the road to Port Fouchon, Highway 1. We raised it 10 feet. Why? It's the only road to put the uh, equipment down to the offshore rigs. Now, uh, maybe Exxon doesn't believe in climate change, or maybe they do, but they believed in the frequency of severe storms enough to raise the only road 10 feet. And that was in Louisiana, so I know you can do better here. Jim talked about vulnerable populations, so I won't cover it. I will say, as a redneck from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it was interesting after Katrina hit, uh, you know, going to DC and listening to people about how stupid we were, and then this thing hit the Northeast where everybody's enlightened and goes to good schools and there's a lot of money, <laughs> and lo and behold, suddenly we actually care what happens to some people. Uh, unless, of course, you're in North Carolina where the legislature tried to outlaw sea level rise. But Mahomey made so much fun of the North Carolina legislature that they decided they wouldn't outlaw sea level rise. They only attempted to legislate the rate of sea level rise. <laughs> now, if I were you, uh, if you have any property on the Outer Banks, uh, you need to think of it as a life estate. You definitely want to sell it. You can't pass it on to your children. Anyway, uh, more Noah stuff. You don't care about that. Uh, so let's talk, about, <laughs> let's talk about managing risks. Because here's the thing. Remember how I talked about how we were so clever in this country to bail people out for living where they live? And by the way, thank you, everyone. I do have a grandfathered flood insurance policy. I appreciate your subsidizing my lifestyle. <laughs> uh, but we all pay. When that emergency supplemental happens, and we put New York City and New Jersey back together, not to mention some places in Massachusetts. And I mean, it was amazing what Sandy hit after Sandy hit. But anyway, we're all actually paying for that. So, so you may be really smart here in Boston, but you know what? Uh, you care in a bunch of us, too, by the way. If you've ever looked at how much money you pay in taxes and how much you get back, by the way, you need to cut a deal with those people in Wyoming who have the opposite ratio going on in terms of taxes. So even if you are smart, even if MWRA is smart uh, here in your local area, even if they're getting smart out on the islands, uh, you're still going to pay. So what they do in Rhode Island is of interest to you. What they do in itsy bitsy New Hampshire, all 16 miles, is an interest of you. Uh, because it does actually affect you. So we know about risk, exposure. Jim talked about the difference between exposure and vulnerability. So exposure is where you're at. Uh, what, what, what is going to get you? And your vulnerability is how clever or not clever you are at what you do about it. Now. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, we thought the solution to frequent inundation was elevation. But when I go to talk about this and I look at the people who are in the crowd, I think to myself, you know, elevation is not really such a smart idea because I've never been in a major storm event in which the electricity doesn't go out. And there's several people in this room right now who I'd hate to have to see climb 20 feet into the air to get to their house. So I think some of our strategies need rethinking in a graying population. I also live in the state that leads the country in the number of new housing starts that are pre-manufactured housing. So what we now have are trailers 20 feet up in the air, which make great projectiles during summer thunderstorms. <laughs> then there's building codes, zoning and building codes. It's a local government issue, planning and zoning every day. Death or resilience by a thousand decisions or not are on the golf course, too. Not only should we have better building codes than we already have, not only should LEED include things besides energy efficiency to include resiliency, uh, but it'd be really nice if we even enforced our building codes. You know, there's some places that have great building codes that don't enforce it. And then there are places like Tennessee and some other states that actually want to roll back building codes. That's so smart on their plans. Uh, contingency plans. As we say in the disaster business, the disaster is never the time to pass out your business cards. If that's what you're doing, you're too late to the party. So first of all, as individuals, in your home, in your business, wherever you spend your time, you need a plan. You need a plan about how, where you're going to go, where's your meetup site, what, how are you going to deal with it. I got uh, a Zodiac and an axe 
and a big old lantern in my attic because I'm not only ready for the storm surge, I'm ready for the tsunami surge. Seriously, southeastern U.S. Anyway, insurance. So HO3 doesn't cover flood. Some of you may have flood insurance uh, because the bank requires you to buy it. Some of you may even have flood insurance because you realize that those flood maps are dated. Many of them are based on dated information, although we've been trying to update them. But the other reality is this. Mother Nature has changed the edge of the 10-year and the 100-year flo uh, flood. Now, we haven't changed the flood maps because that requires congressional approval. And wow, it's been a while since we got that for anything. But I just want you to know, if you're looking at your elevation on your plat, it probably is from the 40s or the 50s, maybe. And if you're looking at that flood map from FEMA, well, actually, I think in Boston, you all got new ones just recently because of Sandy. But there are vast other parts of the country that actually haven't had an updated flood map in a really long time. So there are things you can do to cover your bets. That's what insurance is called. There are things that you can do that are non-structural, natural defenses. You know, oyster reefs, Mother Nature, wetlands. It's amazing what those things can do to save ourselves from ourselves. Uh, and at a far greater cost than some of our best engineers, as a matter of fact. So instead of waiting until the next new development is announced, let us begin now affecting how the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Planning Authority and the Regional Infrastructure Authorities are thinking about the premier development spots, how they're thinking about the infrastructure that they're going to build in the next five years. Because frankly, we really only have about a 10-year window to reduce our risk. If, if my mantra of two meters by 2050 is accurate, then we need to get on this thing, and quickly, wherever we are. And there are things, of course, that we can do structurally. Lord knows, the Army Corps of Engineers makes a living out of building up, tearing down, and building up again. Any engineer can uh, help you a lot with elevation, hardening, redundancy. That's the part we're really good at. Uh, the non-structural, we're not so good at, though it is happening in places. It's happening in Boston. It's happening in the backside of uh, Staten Island. A few places in New Jersey, imagine that, even on the Gulf Coast. It's happening all around the country. And in fact, uh, I think that's one of the really important issues, that we need to begin taking a, a landscape scale systems approach to both our gray and our green infrastructure. The green isn't just for decoration. It's actually an integral part of how we should be designing the things that we depend upon for our life. So this poorly focused slide uh, shows you some examples from all around the country. This is actually also from the Coast chapter of the National Climate Assessment. Uh, and behind this, we actually have about 120 stories of what different communities are doing all around this country. And, and that's the really great thing about it, you know. Uh, I spend too much time in D.C. It's kind of a, a discouraging place sometimes. Uh, and it's when you actually go out and you see what local communities and counties and, and regional authorities are doing. Uh, that's where I get my optimism. Now, Massachusetts, you're famous in the rest of the country for your uh, attitudes. Let's just say it that. Uh, and I believe that we all get the leaders that we deserve and the leaders whose heels that we step on closely. Uh, so I know you are uh, activists at your hearts. I know that uh, the New England tradition of citizen <coughs> activists being engaged in your community is a very important cultural attribute. So, so if you're from Boston, uh, you should reach behind yourself and pat yourself on the back. You're one of the better cities out there. If you're one, one of the burbs around north or south, uh, you might actually take a little inventory of what's going on in your town. Because as Jim mentioned, there are some capital costs associated with this. And one of the things that uh, we're trying to figure out among people like the big financiers, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, as well as the insurance and reinsurance industry, is how do we do things like green bonds? How can we begin to float people to do the things that we already know what to do uh, so that they can begin to do them. Uh, a lot of us are trying to think of some really clever things. One of the things I'd like to see uh, in the next five to 10 years 
Everybody is familiar with depreciating their property, particularly if they hold it for commercial or other kinds of investment purposes. So you depreciate uh, the building that you have. But in this country, we don't depreciate the underlying real estate because we uh, operate on the presumption that it will always be there. Well, I would submit to you that there are places on the Outer Banks, South Florida, the north of Alaska, South Louisiana, just to name a few, where there's a really good possibility there won't be any underlying land in about 30 or 40 years anyway. So if we could set up a generally accepted accounting principle, that's uh, that CPA that you pay money to, knows what I'm talking about, and we could set it up that you could depreciate the underlying land, then we begin to change our cultural attitude about that underlying land, and we begin to view it as a life estate, or like an inholding. When we set up national parks and national forests, we gave people the opportunity to live in their cabin for their use of their life, uh, but once they die, it becomes part of the park or the forest. So uh, there are opportunities for doing this uh, in some geographies. I don't know about the Boston area. Uh, and I think you heard uh, from a couple of my uh, Jamie colleagues. You heard from Jamie Roan about some of the cool stuff we're doing on Storm Surge. And I hope you heard from Jamie Carter uh, some of the things that we're doing with a whole uh, bunch of organizations around Digital Coast, which isn't just data and tools, but it is that. But it's also training. And it's about setting up a community of practice. So since I'm here at the behest of Sea Grant, let me speak to the importance of intermediate organizations and boundary organizations. I'm a Fed. I know my opinion doesn't count for much in a lot of places. Uh, I know my colleagues who have PhDs are, aren't always widely respected in many places. But in many communities, there are groups. They might be community land trusts. Uh, they might be some kind of civic organization. It might be the Sea Grant group at the university. These are people who hang with scientists, and they understand what the scientists are saying, but they also are like normal people. So they can actually hang with normal people. Uh, and they have access to information and resources. And they know where training is. And part of our challenge is, in fact, recognizing that what we're trying to do is build new communities of practice, share stories, share lessons. Let's all make different mistakes, right? Uh, everybody makes mistakes. That's great. Let's just make different mistakes going forward. Let's not rebuild after storms in the same stupid way that we were already present. Uh, just because I live where I live, when that storm comes, by the way, I'm going to be among the first to evacuate. Uh, and secondly, I actually hope to sell it in the next five years. So if anybody like to come south, let me know. So the most important thing, I think, is that it does, in fact, take a village to raise a village. And you can spell that R-A-I-S-E, or you can spell it R-A-Z-E. But it still <laughs> takes a village. A and you can't just look to the academic and the public sector uh, for a variety of reasons. Increasingly, it takes everyone in the community. It's a true multi-sector effort. Now, maybe it's not this way in Boston, but all the enlightened places I've lived, like Texas and Louisiana and Colorado and South Carolina, just to name a few, and Rhode Island, uh, the, the people at the chamber uh, ran the table if they wanted to run the table. And they often were the people who were calling the shots on big economic projects long before anybody in the public sector even knew about them. So I think it takes the private sector. I think it takes them in the people who have money at risk, like the bankers and the insurance people. There's a reason that the Urban Land Institute, which is the really big boys who build and the people who bond them and finance them, uh, just put out a report about resilient coasts uh, because they get it. Uh, they have worldwide exposure. But in your community, find the people that you need to be working with. And they may not just be at the university. They may be in a variety of types of organizations. Boundary organizations uh, is what we tend to call them in the academic literature. But at the end of the day, what it's all about is collaborating. Collaborating with people in a particular place to accomplish a particular vision, a particular set of objectives. Uh, and it takes that community to do it. The other thing is we have to change the nature of the discussion when we're talking about climate change. So I'm going to assume that every one of you in this room actually thinks climate change is real. Who in this room thinks climate change is a bunch of hogwash? Oh, 
Nobody. What a surprise about that. <laughs> okay. So, but that's the problem. You see, we spend a lot of time talking to each other. Now, I grew up in Texas, so uh, this is my uh, adopt a troglodyte speech. <laughs> Each one of us has one in our family, in our community, religious, neighborhood, or civic group. We all know a troglodyte for whom we are a trusted resource, a friend, maybe even, someone that they listen to. Maybe they get advice from you about cars. Maybe they get advice from you about some engineering problem. But we all know someone who is not in this space with us, and yet who thinks of you uh, as a credible individual. That's the person you need to work on. Each one of us needs to adopt a troglodyte this year and work on them. Because that's the only way that we're going to change the numbers. You know, we spent, uh, I can't even, probably 100 billion in the US alone on climate models, global circulation models over the last 30 years. And we still edge around 50% of the people think climate change is an issue. That's a pretty piss poor return on our investment. So we actually, it's not about the models. It's about the communication. And communication begins with each one of us. I bet each one of you can have a really thoughtful discussion about risk in your own life and how you think about it with someone else that you know who probably needs to think about it a lot more. So, uh, Judith, I don't know if that's actually what you wanted. Uh, <laughs> people are acting now. We just need to increase the number of people and communities that are acting and the number of states that get it. Uh, and uh, I like coming to talk to you all, but uh, you should come down to my place sometime if you think it's hard up here. Anyway, Hubert, right. back to you. Thank you.